I'm going to go ahead and start the City Council work session. For the record, it is Tuesday, December 10th. It is 4.32. We'll start with roll call attendance. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Milam. Here. Councilmember Palmer. Here. Councilmember Little Roberts. Here. Councilmember Kavanagh. Here. Councilmember Borden. Here. Mayor DeVere. Here. Item number two is the adoption of the agenda. Madam Mayor. Mr. Borden. There are no changes. I move we adopt the agenda as published. Second. A motion and a second to adopt the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All ayes. There were no items moved from the consent agenda, so we'll move right into the consent agenda. <laughs> <laughs> How was that? <laughs> Mr. Borton. Madam Mayor, I move. <laughs> Did you turn your mic on? It wasn't so, you bet. Madam Mayor, I move we approve the consent agenda as published for the mayor to sign and clerk to attest. Second. A motion and second to approve the consent agenda. Mr. Clerk, will you call roll? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Milam? Aye. Councilmember Palmer? Aye. Councilmember Little Roberts? Aye. Councilmember Kavanagh? Aye. Councilmember Borton? Aye. All ayes. Item 5A is under our Parks and Recreation Department. And I will turn this over to Mr. Sidaway, who, by the way, put on an amazing parade, him and his team. Um, it was awesome. Good job. It was great. It is definitely a team effort, and I got to give props to Renee as our chief elf when it comes to parade uh, related items. But uh, thank the council members that were able to come and participate in the in the festivities. I, I think it was, I think I say it every year, but I mean it every year that I think it was our best yet. And uh, the crowd was amazing. I think the weather maybe had something to do with that because it's a little warmer than usual. But huge crowd, um, but and the people that brought the floats, I just got to oh. say, they really stepped yeah. up the floats this year. I mean, they were some quality floats. It was a fun, fun parade. So, so Who thank you. Who did the under the sea? I don't know, but I can find out. It was amazing with the mermaid. Um, well, thank you. And uh, so you've heard from some other departments already on KPIs. Uh, my purpose in coming before you is, is to ask, you know, about, you know, we've been doing research on KPIs, trying to identify, um, we, you know, what we usually uh, provide, um, what you might want to hear that we haven't provided, and um, we're, we just want to know if we're tracking the right things from your perspectives, and, and uh, so, I won't read this to you. You know the mission, vision, and values, but I put this on here for a reason. Everything we do related to KPIs has to tie back to this. It's, it's imperative to me that it furthers our mission, ties in with our values, and so as we're you know, creating charts that um, you know, will track these, I, I have these at the top uh, of all of them because I think the question is, if, if we're tracking this, does it, does it further this mission? Does it, does it enhance this vision? Uh, does it fall in line with these values of quality, community, and fun? Um, now, for me, one of the most important things that I have learned in going through this exercise through the summer until now, I have found three types, three categories of KPIs that I divide my KPIs into, and I think most would fall into one of these three categories. Outputs are what we typically present to you. Those are, when I come before you in May and we do our uh, strategic presentations, you, know, you see the graphs and the charts that look, look like this, that um, have you know, our registration numbers. I, and I put by the numbers because that, those are the numbers the output measures are the things that we can pull out of our system. In terms of KPIs, they are the, the easiest, perhaps, to get, and certainly a meaningful measure of whether we're growing or stagnant or declining in certain areas. Um, but I think the holy grail of KPIs is not necessarily the outputs, but the outcomes. Those are harder and more costly to measure. Um, they usually come from surveys, but that comes, you know, the impact on the citizen. Um, 
And as much as we can, I'm interested in, in those measures and not just the numbers, but what's the, what's the impact on a citizen? Now, we have a, a habit as a city of doing biannual um, uh, citywide surveys. And right now, that's where these numbers would come from. So these numbers are not monthly. These numbers are not, you know, we can get monthly numbers for outputs. Uh, outcomes are going to come when we do a survey. Um, and then cost recovery, there's been a lot of added focus and discussion on that. And we have adopted policies in the park system master plan for certain categories of uh, cost recovery. And these, the ability to track, now we track these internally already, but um, uh, a, a KPI type tool I would like to develop, this is not developed yet, this is an idea, to work with Brad Purser in finance and just like they're working on all their models for uh, priority-based budgeting, I think we could create some, some ways to, to track cost recovery on some of these. So with that overview of kind of the three categories, let me tell you the, the, the kinds of, uh, of KPIs that I see. Um, we're going to go through them in this order. In the parks division, we have KPIs related to public parks, pathways, urban forestry. In the recreation division, um, we have KPIs related to the things that our recreation manager does, specifically field reservations, things like that, as well as sports, classes and camps, community events, and volunteers. Then we have KPIs related to the home court division and our admin division. So first one was, was public parks. Output measures for public parks, um, uh, total acres that are developed. You know, it's a, a number that we track, that's an output. Our acres per thousand LOS level of service is one that I think we're all familiar with and one of our key performance indicators into how well we're keeping up with growth in terms of providing parks to our citizens. Um, now, and this third bullet is not one that we currently track, but one that I would like to. I call it the community-wide effective LOS level, and we have looked into this number once before. Um, and what this is is, if we were to look at, I'm a citizen, okay? And as a citizen, my feeling of how many parks are out there is not just based on the city's public parks, but my HOA park that's across the street and all these other uh, open spaces, including the schools and, and things. Uh, I'd like to work with IT to develop uh, an ability to look at what I'm calling the community-wide effective level of service. When we looked at it a few years ago, you know, our level of service as a city was about three acres per thousand. The effective level of service, <clears throat> when you included all the private HOA parks and everything, was closer to 10. And 10 is the number I most often hear nationally as the national, it's, they, they fall short of calling it a national standard because they, they know every community is different, but I, you hear the number 10 acres per thousand a lot out there. And it was interesting to me to see that, well, when we look at everything, not just our own, but what the, what the private sector provides as well, that effective level of service tends to be closer to that level. So um, not to spend too much time on that, but I thought that needed a little bit of explanation. Um, outcomes. Now, these, I took these straight out of the last citywide survey. So the questions we asked for outcomes were citizens' ratings on the quality, appearance, and maintenance of city parks, the quality of our athletic fields, the number of city parks, and the percentage of households who visited a park in the last 12 months. <clears throat> so those are citizen outcomes that are currently being asked, have been asked in the last couple of surveys. So we would like to see them continue to be measured um, whenever, when a survey does go out. Um, pathways, we can measure the linear, linear feet of pathway added to the pathway network annually. Uh, this wouldn't be a monthly measure, but because uh, they don't happen that fast, but each year we can take a look. And we currently measure those ones that we do. I think you may remember, you may not remember, because you have a lot of strategic presentations, but I mentioned in my strategic presentation last May that I had just discovered that week that the number of pathways out in the community was much higher than what I had been re reporting because we were just focusing on the ones that we do. Um, when we worked with GIS and got, looked at what had been constructed through development, um, there was almost three times the length of pathways than what um, 
we knew. So that's something I'd like to continue to, to track. Uh, linear fee added by us, uh, by the development community, and then cha change those same two into totals. What's the total number of pathways that we maintain? And then what's the total number of pathways out there that HOAs or business owners associations or the private sector maintains? Um, then in those surveys, the outcome measures um, include citizen ratings for the number of pathways and the quality of those pathways. And again, I'd like to just see those kinds of questions continue to be asked. Um, in urban forestry, uh, we track the number of trees that are added to the system annually, and then the total report on that, and those numbers are needed for our annual applications to be a Tree City USA, and those uh, kinds of uh, things. Um, and then in the recreation division, I mentioned that our recreation manager is over uh, field reservations. Uh, first one I have down though is revenue. Um, so total recreation, recreation revenue, including sports, classes, events, and contracts. That's a number that we can track. Um, the field reservation revenue um, is actually separate from those. And then the field reservation hours that are, you know, the number of hours that people are reserving in our parks. Um, there, I just realized that outcome measure just says citizen rating. I think there is one in the... But whatever it is that's in the survey that's been going out, we would want to continue that. Um, for sports, um, this is, we have the output measures for the number of sports teams, as well as the sports revenue. Outcomes include the, the quality and the number of adult sport, sporting programs that are available to their citizens. And then here is where we have an adopted cost recovery philosophy for sports programs, and are we meeting that benchmark? So we'd like to develop the tool to report on that. Um, classes and camps similarly has outputs for the number of activity guide enrollments by year. We also track it by guide. So that, and by guide what that means is we have our winter, spring, summer, and our fall. So we have three different activity guides each year. So we, we track the, res uh, the, the reservations by, uh, by guide or by season, if you will, as well as uh, for the year and then the revenues for those. Um, outcomes from the surveys include the quality and variety of the, those programs, and then the number. Are we offering enough? Uh, are people, do people want to see more? And then we have a, a cost recovery philosophy adopted by council for classes and camps as well. That takes us to community events. Um, outputs is really just our list of what events we're putting on. We have attempted to do other outputs, like the number of people, it was the obvious one. There's no turnstile on events, though. And the best that we've can, been able to do is a, a guesstimate on how many people we think are here. That's proven to be inaccurate and not something that we think is really reportable. But, uh, um, but outcomes, again, from those surveys would be citizen ratings on the number of events that are put on, as well as the quality and variety of those events. And then we have independent cost recovery me measures adopted by, by event. Um, uh, and they vary a little bit. So like Independence Day Festival, we put so much toward the fireworks that we don't recover. But other ones like <coughs> Christmas, we recover these. And you know, movie nights almost completely break even. Whereas Gene Kleiner Day, we just put on. Um, so there's a variety of different cost recovery philosophies adopted for those, and we would like to track those. Volunteers is a great one. Um, our outputs in terms of numbers would be our volunteer hours and our uh, number of volunteers. Um, outcomes would be the cost savings to the city that come as a result of that. Um, and then home court. We're looking at uh, the number of hours of court reservations, the number of monthly court memberships, which is primarily pickleball these days, and uh, the number of open gym participants and check-ins. Um, cost recovery measures would look at the home court revenue uh, versus those expenditures for both personnel and operating um, and how those compare. <coughs> Excuse me. In admin, so the, the shelters, I don't know, uh, could, could be in parks as, a, as a, a revenue item, 
In the budget, they, they exist in the admin division. It's our administrative staff, sorry, that um, uh, take those reservations and that's where it resides. You know, we could, wherever you want it re uh, reported, we can report it there. But um, shelter reservation revenue, shelter reservation hours, and then um, we're starting to look at the number of online enrollments. You know, since we changed over our system, we've been seeing people migrating from only calling to, um, uh, to more people able to register online, which is great. Interestingly, I also recently did a, I would expect the phone calls to have reduced because of that. The number of phone calls coming in are still increasing, and I don't know why yet, but I wanna start tracking the why and see if I can figure out you know, why people are calling and how we might be able to get that information to them better. Um, and then the other output measure would be that our number of Facebook followers, which we have a, a large presence on, on Facebook. Our outcomes would be our citizen rating on the um, information and availability, uh, the availability of information for our rec programs. So that's an overview. This is what I'm proposing that I think makes sense to report to council. I would like to know if you think we're measuring the right things. Are we missing something that you'd like to see that I haven't noted? Are we measuring some things that you don't care about? Because if that's the case, we shouldn't be spending the time doing it. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Steve. Council, any questions? Madam Mayor. Mr. Borton. I'll answer your question with a question. I love the data. I think it's great and valuable the way you presented it um, and definitely worth tracking. But do you think it's also worth us recognizing a distinction in any particular region of the city as we've grown now? Is it, are we getting to the stage where we need to track some of these metrics, whether it's a north, south of the freeway mm. concept or? By geographic region? Right, to, to, just to see if we've distributed some of these resources more um, I don't the think the numbers even can be tracked. Maybe there's something, but I'm, I don't think there's a meaningful distinction there. The only place it is meaningful is looking at a map of where we're providing these park resources in particular, right. pathways to. Um, and we do look at that, and that'd be something for us to present is the geographic dispersion of parks in particular. And are we, are we just serving one group of our citizens or are we serving everyone? And that's frankly one of the things that I love to point out. Whenever I make a, a community presentation, I show our map because I think it shows that we have made a concerted effort to go to every area of the city. But in, in that aspect, I think it's worth looking at geographic distribution. But in terms of, I don't know how we would get to like, uh, sport registrations by geography, not with the data sure. that we collect. Yeah, it, it, Madam Mayor, and that doesn't certainly apply to some of those metrics, but I was just wondering if there's some that, and maybe we're not there yet either, that we're curious on how our pathways or, yeah. or tree development or... And as this space. goes forward, if you, if anyone sees something that makes sense to look at in a regional basis, you know, I suppose we can always yeah. pull that out. Thanks. Or perhaps you get a question from a citizen and you think, why aren't we tracking that? Um, we're currently not always always looking for those. Yeah, yeah. what's meaningful? Mr. Kavanagh. Thank you. First, Steve, thanks to you and your team for not just the parade, but for the council's float and the parks and recreation float. There's always glows a little more brighter than ours, but uh, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> too, too jealous about that. It's, it's your You're point, very welcome. The parade gets better every year, and we sure appreciate your team and all they do for us. A, a couple questions for you. One, what I loved is, as you were talking about this, I'm writing down, well, what about this? And on the next slide you'd cover it. And what about that? And on the next slide you'd cover it. So I think you did a good job of trying to encompass the variety of different questions you may receive. Uh, part, one of the things that you, you wanted to get some citizen feedback on was related to our pathways. Mm -hmm. And I want to get some more insight from that. What do you hope to achieve? Are we asking them what they think of the quality of our pathways, or is this more where would you like to see more pathways? The way the, number, the, way the questions have been asked so far is, do you th how, rate the number of pathways we have available? And that's typically been fairly low because people want to see more. It's asking, do you think we have enough pathways? Um, it might be a better way to ask that. I, I captured the way it's been asked in the past. 
Um, so if we were going to continue asking it kind of as a benchmark, then that's how it was asked. But the idea is to ask both about number and quality. Do we have enough pathways? Would you like to see more? How's the quality? Are they being kept well? Are they in disrepair? That, we're trying to get at that. M Madam Mayor, and Steve, I think the reason why I ask is at least for me, if I'm always asked, do I want more pathways? <laughs> I'm always going to probably say yes. And so good point. <laughs> there's got to be some point where we say, okay, we, we feel that we've got a, a, the, the right amount or this is the goal that we're reaching for. And you've been a, a great proponent of talking about, you know, acres of, of open space or acres of parkland per citizen. Mm -hmm. And that's a metric that I can get behind. And I think as we continue on, being able to say this is how many miles of pathway per citizen or whatever we want to have hmm. would, 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 would be something that we can at least – at least I know when a budget request comes, we want to do X amount of dollars towards pathways, mm -hmm. and it's going to get us that much closer to our goal. That's something for me, who is a big proponent of yeah. pathways, to wrap my head around because we're, we're building towards a goal. So just food for thought as, okay. as that is, is further uh, addressed. Um, you talked a lot about, which I appreciate, about the adoptive cost recovery policy. And it, it almost sounded like this is an already adopted yeah. policy, and I don't know if I just missed it, if I don't remember it, or if this is something that is happening internally. So help me get caught up to speed on that. Uh, I'm talking about the adopted philosophies that are in the master plan that was approved by council five-ish years ago. Um, I, we have those pulled out. I think I shared those with council even, it was either earlier this year or last year as a refresher, but I know a lot comes your way. I'd be glad to, sh to resend them. I'd, I'd love that. Yeah. And, and then... The, the only I guess, question that I have, and, it's, and I don't know if it's, it's beneficial for council or for staff, and I'm just curious your thoughts, is if along that line about the cost recovery, is if we are weighing the cost of parks programs um, or the cost of operating our parks in general, cost per citizen or, you know, cost per, I mean, to me, cost per citizen is the thing that I come back to. So as a citizen, this is what it, it's costing each of our citizens to operate and is there a national benchmark against that what what do cities spend per citizen on yeah. parks and who are the cities i think that we're one of the best when it comes to parks so are we a, a leader but doing things the way Meridian does in a very fiscally prudent way um, are there other lessons to be learned from other communities those are the things that i'm always going to be looking for and I, I've never seen a standard to benchmark against nationally we always have the option opportunity to you know, look at whatever we think is a, a city that we consider to be yeah. similar or alike or because cities vary so dramatically. That's why they won't give us a number of acres per th thousand as a national benchmark because they, they won't even give you acres, let alone cost, um, because they vary so widely city to city as to what each city thinks they need. But um, it's an interesting thought, and I will – Give it some more thought. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Madam Mayor. Ms. Milam. Thank you, Steve. Great report. Um, I, I do find that interesting, what Councilman Kavanagh was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, otherwise, I think you covered everything very well. Um, one thought, as we look at like priority-based budgeting and figuring out what programs to keep doing, and, and you're talking about not knowing how many attendees we have at certain events. And yeah. I, I think at some point that that might become something that you need to focus on in order to prioritize events and, and change things up and maybe have new events and get rid of some old ones that aren't doing yeah. so well. Um, and I don't know how to do that, but maybe you have a booth at the beginning where everybody has to walk by with a raffle and somebody <laughs> you have to get a ticket and put your name on it to win. I, you're still not going to get 100% participation, but you probably get quite a few people putting their name in. Internally, we still estimate crowd attendance. We know if it's roughly a thousand or ten thousand, right? But and I think we can watch gauge like movie night attendance, and we can know if it's increasing, decreasing, or staying about the same. But the only real way for us to do it is is anecdotally. We you know it's we know it's decreasing. We need to look at this, ask ourselves why, so that we're not just ignoring the fact. You know, so events live their lives and we finish them and move on sure. to something else all the time. And so we're not afraid to, to ask those questions, but uh, there's not a good way to do the, the actual turnstile count, but we do keep an eye on, is it increasing or decreasing? 
Yeah. Thank you. And I, I think it's more less um, counting heads on the big event. I mean, it's the big events you have a hard time estimating, and those aren't the ones that are really threatened to um, say Need we're to not going to do yeah. it anymore. It, it's really like the barn sour. Barn sour. That's and, a good. And you know, as yeah. those numbers were declining. We said mm, shelf life. That one we did have a turnstile because we had registrations. <laughs> we had to register for the race, mm -hmm. and they were declining. And there was a lot of new races in the valley, and we decided, you know, Let's these other races can it. take over. We can put our resources elsewhere. Right. Yep, that's a good example. Okay. Anything else? Miss Low Roberts. Madam Mayor, Steve, thank you so much. Great ideas. Great report. Um, one thing that I think would be kind of interesting, and I don't even know if this is kind of a reasonable do, but I know that with the master plan on pathways, I think it would be real interesting to see like what's left, what's still needed, and how you chip away at it each year. Yes. We are constantly looking at that, um, and I would just say yes, I agree. Okay. Thank you. But yeah. thank you that all that you and your team do. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Under B, we have Mr. Neri. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. This is probably not quite as cool as Steve's, but uh, if it looks familiar, it's because I blatantly stole this template from Todd. Um, so this is our, our KPI update, and this, one is, this one's been a challenge uh, for a couple reasons. One, again, we don't really have a lot of metrics in our business. Um, whatever needs to get done, we get it done. That's really the metric I follow the most of. Make sure nobody's asking for it. Make sure it's done when uh, timely. Make sure it's done correct the first time. That's really the metric that means the most to me. But we do have a few different things in, in the legal department that we do address, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. First, the area that we do have at least some metrics that are created for this, and this is in the risk management area. So our strategic plan 4D1 is the one uh, strategic plan objective that we've had. Uh, we've been working on creating a team, creating a much more comprehensive program for the city, uh, a much cleaner reporting system, a much cleaner um, review process. Uh, we have a team that's made up of primarily directors of the various departments, myself, public works, parks, police, fire, HR, finance, to talk about the various things that we do track. So we can start with, we, we obviously get claims that come through the clerk's office. We get a number of claims per year. We also have the claims that are paid. So we know how many, how many claims we get and how many, how many that are get paid through ICRIM. And then, of course, we know what our premium is to ICRIM. So what's the purpose of tracking all that? Well, again, we want to evaluate the types of claims we have. We're looking for trends. We're looking for consistencies um, of types of claims. And with that, we then have to look at, is training necessary? Is it an equipment issue? Is it something else? And we discuss it on a quarterly basis with our team to look if we can do some cross-training. Um, one of the things that's come out of this, this exercise is we've had a lot more information sharing among the departments, especially police, fire, with public works because many of the things you do are very similar in nature and training-wise from a safety standpoint. So there's been a lot more opportunity to have some cross-training or at least some knowledge also of what we're doing. And the secondary thing, one of the things that's really helped, what I think, with our team is helped a lot of the directors understand the bigger picture of the process. In the past, all the directors are pretty aware of what happens with their claims. They're not very aware of anybody else, and they're not very aware of what types of things are occurring citywide. And so again, we're looking at trends in regards to, for example, driving issues. If we have a lot of driving types of issues or claims, then we can look at that and see whether or not we can do some cross-training with the departments that do a lot of driving, like police and public works and parks. So we really want to um, maximize that value of the information that we have and that we're already using. And so that's been another thing we've been able to use in trying to evaluate that. Again, like I said, we use that to help establish training and be able to have, again, that sort of cross between the different departments of the different things that we do. Questions on that particular piece? Madam Mayor. Mr. Kavner. Hey, just a quick question, Bill, and, and this a KPI being based on claims filed. Uh, 
it's not something that I mean, your department has very has nothing to do with the amount of claims that are filed against the city. And so, is that a a challenging KPI because it's not something that you guys I mean. I don't think that we've had any claims filed against the city attorney's office. So no, you're you're correct. No, but these every so every tort claim that comes comes through our office, sure. and so we can see the bigger picture of the types of claims that we're getting uh, versus police versus fire versus parks versus public works. Those are predominantly the, where the claims are coming from, and so we do see them all. And so what's been happening with our team now that all those different directors are getting to see what's happening with the other departments that they weren't aware that they had driving issues or they've had claims. Certainly, you know, we track two types of two types of claims. We collapse claims when we cause some sort of damage to the public. Uh, sometimes it's our fault that we repair it. Sometimes it's really not our fault and we may not repair it. And then we track the things that, that damage that occurs to us. People run into the cars, people run into our equipment, those kinds of things. So those are the two predominant types of claims that we get. Um, and we tend to look, again, we, we evaluate each of those claims and determine how we're going to handle it, whether we're going to settle it, resolve it, whether we're not. Um, but I think a lot of that is, you know, ha having the number, I think, is just a, it's a metric that's good to know. I mean, the claims go up or down. Uh, we can't control most of them, sure. certainly. Those um, claims also will show maybe areas that we need to do training in. And that's where the departments look at them, mm -hmm. but also by um, them going to one single point, we can also see if any of those trends go beyond one department and you start seeing something citywide. Then, then that's the risk management piece mm -hmm. that um, Bill heads up a, a committee that then discusses those and puts strategies in place to um, how to avoid those claims and be more proactive instead of reactive. So, Madam Mayor, if, I, if I'm hearing things right, then this is listed as a KPI because under the risk management banner, you're engaging with departments on education and training to reduce the likelihood of claims in the future. Yes, certainly. Okay. That's so exactly we, correct. Because we're looking, again, the, the control that we have, obviously, is the potential damage that we may cause to other people. Obviously, I can't predict somebody running into our cars. But right. the other way around, we could hopefully alleviate the number of times that we run into somebody else's car. The other thing that we do on the training piece, too, in evaluating trends, is we look also, human resources is part of the team because they manage all of the workers' comp claims. So we sure. can see if there are injuries related to some type of internal activity, sometimes training or something else, so we can determine, again, do we need to do different types of training or different other uh, information to the departments to help alleviate that as well. So the next area we'll, we'll look at, and we obviously gather data in regards to is our prosecution of police services. So this, again, we're looking at the number of cases that we transfer to the city of Boise. Uh, we also then look at the percentage of caseload, because that percentage of caseload is directly related to the cost we pay for that service. If you recall back when we were having the discussions with the court, the court was saying to us at the time, the city of Meridian was approximately 20% of this countywide caseload. We also found we were about 20% of the city of Boise's caseload. Now that number is closer to 26%. So it is increasing as we grow. And so those are numbers that we at least need to be aware of so we can forecast on the horizon the cost per case, which then will relate to the cost and services that we can pay for that we need to, whether we provide that either ourselves or in another method or continue to do it the way we have been um, since 2002 with the city of Boise. The quality of service we've been receiving has been very consistent, it's been very high. The police department's been very pleased with the service they've been receiving all these years. And so we haven't, we haven't uh, had any desire to move, but we have had the ability to at least go evaluate the cost of that service if we were to do it with another agency or to try to provide it ourselves to determine whether or not the value that we're paying for is really a, an actual value that we think is, is reasonable. And to this day, we believe it is. So again, that's the cost benefit piece. That's the last number. And then that way we can evaluate the bigger picture. Because again, as we grow, the larger the caseload becomes, we have to make that decision. Um, partly why we were looking at over the last year is we didn't want to get caught shorthanded 
what happened when the state decided they no longer could do our building services any longer and simply said we're done and gave us a very short window to do that. The criminal prosecution world is a lot more complicated even than that, and that was pretty complicated in itself. But for us to ramp up to doing that in a very short window would be very difficult. So we were trying to look at what alternatives are out there in case that were to happen, or in case, again, you know, things change, people change, different things happen that, that, could, that could occur. We just wanted to make sure we were prepared if that were to happen. And we certainly haven't been addressing that or haven't had a need to address it to this point. The last area is one of the harder ones for me to try to capture in these metrics because this is the things that we do day in and day out. And as, a, as much of a dinosaur as I feel like in this area of, of uh, capturing metrics, you know, we do capture and, and on our annual report. Uh, I know you're all looking forward to it. It's in February. You guys can tune in if you're not here. And the annual report, we do track a lot of these things that we do by numbers, you know, we track the number of resolutions, we track the number of ordinances we do, we track the number of development agreements, we track the number of other agreements that we do. It's, it's all relative to a bigger picture, right? I've said many times to the mayor when she's asked, I said, you know, we could do one agreement that we might take six months to work out, and we could do 10 agreements that takes us less than an hour because they're very similar. So it really is, it's, it's just a snapshot of some of the work we do and how we do it. So what's the purpose of even looking at those numbers? Again, as we grow and things become more complex, what I've tasked our team is we need to figure out a way to start evaluating the more complex matters that we deal with. You know, whether it's uh, a complex contract, uh, a complex issue of like with the Verizon, we've had a long discussion with Verizon over the three years of, of having an agreement with Verizon regarding 5G. That's been a very complex issue. So we've got to be able to capture that because I think future mayors, future council are going to want to know, you know, when, you're, when, we, when we feel from the legal department that we need more assistance, whether it's internal or external, we have to be able to show that. We have to be able to have some metric and some way to, to show that example of why we don't just feel busy, but we actually are busy. And so we've got to do better capturing that kind of data to be able to provide that, that kind of information to the mayor and council in the future. And then again, we also want to see how much time we're dedicating to the different departments. As most of you know, we don't dedicate one attorney to a particular department or two, two or three departments. We really try to deal with the subject matters in a very broader context because we think we get a better product. I hope that we can continue to do that. I don't know whether or not the changing landscape of the city or the changing landscape of the legal world will make that more difficult to do, but that's really our goal is to continue to do things the way we have. We think it's a model that's worked pretty well. Um, a lot of other cities, you know, look to us uh, as an example on how to do this internally. So, but we have to be able to at least capture how much time does that take. Um, when I asked other cities around the state how they did it, they all had the same question, well, we don't do that. We don't track any of our time. We just track the time, you know, we just do the work and get it done. And I've asked them back the same question, well, how do you then establish when you need another person? Well, and so far, most of them haven't been able to answer. So I'm hopeful we can maybe lead the way on that discussion as well and say, well, we can at least show why it's busier. And it's not just because we feel busy, but we've actually got some data to show that. Those are the three areas that we tend to capture. I'm going to bring it back with our annual update with some numbers attached to those uh, as we start to collect this data. Some of it we have. Some of it's kind of new to us for we're trying to capture, but that's kind of our objective, if that kind of makes sense to everybody. This is our team outing this year. We got to go on the blue, and we got to go tour the athletic facilities of Boise State. It was tough. I didn't wear my Vandal shirt because I thought that wouldn't be very nice. So, um, would have been a good picture, though. Yeah, yeah, but it was pretty <coughs> fun. So, anyway, questions? Thank you, Bill. All Council, right. any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, item 5C is our police department, our annual report, and KPI discussion. Madam Mayor, Council, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to um, give my thanks to the men and women of the Meridian Police Department. Um, any successes that you hear today is because of them. I can tell you that we have a great team. Um, 
they do great work, and, and I'm awfully proud of them. Um, reading the, the news today, there was a business in uh, Baltimore that, that uh, gave their profit sharing, divided amongst their employees, $10 million, which averaged about 50000 per employee. But if you're there long enough, you got 250000 I can't do that for them. But I could, if I could, I would. Um, the other thing I like to do is, is recognize a few people up there in the kiosk. Um, Councilwoman Little Roberts and Councilwoman Milam and Councilman um, Palmer have all been um, police liaisons over the years, and they're all leaving us. So I'd like to uh, thank you for what you've done for us and for our community. Um, it's, it's appreciated. And then Mayor Tammy. Um, all I can say is it's been an honor, and you're going to be missed, and uh, more on Thursday. How's that? Technology challenged. I want to start today off with uh, um, not going over it, but just letting you take a, 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 a review of the mission and vision. Um, one of the things that makes us successful is our culture. And it's one thing that, that uh, we pride ourselves on. And it's the other thing that, um, you know, Mayor Tammy has a lot to do with it, is that we had set, ex set expectations for our for our team, and, and it's taken us quite a while to get there, but we cherish what we have. We love our reputation. We are th um, seeked out um, from uh, other states to come here, and it's something we're proud of, and it really starts with, with our mission and what it's all about, and we can't do this alone. It has to be in partnership with our, our community, and, and it's not all about just writing tickets and throwing people in jail. It's educating people to um, do the right thing and um, preventing crime when we get a chance. As if we can prevent it, then that's less work we have to do taking reports. And so um, our people get it. I think our community gets it, and that's what makes us great. But uh, had to include that in there. One of the things I have to do is, is go just a little bit faster than Steve because I thought he was the police chief talking there for a little bit today with that, that presentation. Throughout um, our presentation today, we're going to have some key performance indicators um, mixed throughout just to talk about. But the reason why this one is in here is this is one we're probably the most proud of. And if you look at what you're, you're seeing is, is our response times. And our response times, we track them on code one, code two, code three. Code three is emergencies, code two are urgent, code one are just um, report type calls. And we track this, trend this by um, five years we look at. But uh, in this particular case, we just, it, it wouldn't all fit on the screen. So it's a, a smaller representation of what we have. But because of the positions that you've uh, appropriated and because of the training and getting the officers on the road we've been able to reduce our response time significantly one of the things that uh, we look at when we're tracking these is three to five minutes is the average that we're shooting for on um, code three responses emergencies um, <coughs> Of course, we'd always like to have a less than three minutes because if if it's that's three minutes that you have to protect yourself until we can get there. So it's the quicker it can be, um, the better it is. But three to five minutes is the standard. For code two, we strive for six to eight minutes, um, and you can see that we're meeting that. And then for um, priority one calls, ten to twenty minutes. And we're meeting that. Calls for service. This should not be surprising to anyone. This is far more than um, uh, I realized, but uh, this covers both officer initiated and um, citizen initiated calls for service. 
The one thing I will note is all of the 2019 figures that you're seeing here um, only go through November. So they don't go through the end of December. So they will be higher than what you're seeing here. This probably doesn't surprise anybody. Um, one of the things that uh, unfortunately comes with a growing city when the infrastructure doesn't grow is um, additional crashes. Now, it has increased, but it hasn't increased drastically. That's, that's the main thing, is that uh, well, we are seeing an increase in crashes. Citations. These are the citations that uh, the officers are writing. These could be misdemeanor citations or infractions. You will see that the number is a little bit lower. Keep in mind that's only 11 months for 2019, but I think you are going to see a, a decline in citations written this year. And looking at the trends, um, it's because, and I'll show you another slide coming up, is we're doing more public initiated calls than we are officer initiated. Um, we're just frankly getting a lot of 911 calls and calls for service from the citizens, which, take, which are reactive and not proactive. These are the number of calls for, uh, or not calls for service, these are the number of uh, uh, citation, or not uh, citations, um, reports. That's it, reports. Uh, this is the number of reports that have been um, written to date. Um, this is probably a point where listening to the questions that uh, um, the other uh, directors have gotten over the last couple of weeks or so is just to point out that we track these by city, we track these by areas. We have three areas in the city, and we track these by what we call reporting districts, which are square miles. So I don't put those forward facing, but I can tell you how many reports are taking within a square mile with any part of the city. So if it's ever um, desired, I can get that. And that's what we often use when we're pulling up the stats for homeowners association meetings and sometimes when the mayor's office will ask us about certain areas in the city. So we do track that down to the square mile. The one thing last week when I was listening to the uh, public records request from Chris's office, I'm going, I think I got you beat just by a little bit. But uh, I remember when CJ was here, he would talk about his 300 public records requests, and I said, well, let's talk about my 3,000, and now you can see that we're up to uh, over 8,000 public records requests. I will tell you that this is a job for two FTEs. Um, fortunately, the one FTA only does it part-time, but it's, it's one and a half FTEs just to um, complete our public records request. We uh, conform to um, state law, which is three days to 10 days. Um, oftentimes, we will get um, requests that are much broader than people realize. And it would take significant staff time to provide them with the information they request, i.e. Um, body-worn cameras if they want, video of hours and hours and hours. They don't like the bill that they get um, or the estimate of the bill that they get. So we have to narrow that down a little bit. We can't ask them why they want something, but we can help them focus their scope a little bit to get them um, what they need without any cost to them. So. Um, we have uh, Boise paralegals that do our public records requests, and then for the big ones, they're reviewed by our uh, Boise legal through our contract. So in June and July, I believe it was, we've had um, MADC come in and have um, Crime Prevention come in and gave you their own presentations. Um, so I'm not going to 
get into um, that too much. I will tell you that um, there's a couple highlights, though, that I want to mention. Um, crime prevention is working on their 19th, 19-19 Public Safety Academy. That's going to start on April 2nd. And the drug prevention, or uh, MADC is updating their bylaws and their strategic plan currently. Chief, um, in response to the, the academy, we used to have an alumni group that, that came together and, and there was some continued involvement with the police department and or fire department. <coughs> Do we see um, continued engagement from those that, that participated? Yeah, I'm happy to say that we do see the alumni do come back. Um, not the whole group, but we do see um, some that come back. They always show up on the first night and kind of give a, an update of what um, for the group to expect. They often will um, serve the treats and refreshments and some too. And I'm proud to say that two of them um, are continued um, police volunteers today been there for years and years and years come in every Tuesday and Thursday so it kind of ebbs and flows you get a lot sometimes you get one maybe or two the next time but they do come back and we do hold on to them I can't speak so much for the fire department but I do believe they also have the same thing that show up there I'm getting a nod yes <laughs> thank you it's it's awesome to see and they're a better spokesperson than we are uh, when they talk to the group. You know, that's a, that's a funny story. I still remember back when we used to do a citizen's academy. It was a police citizen's academy, and, and it went okay, um, depending on who was running it. And then the mayor wanted to do a public safety academy, and this is back when police and fire were competitors, and I guess we're still competitors, but we didn't work together well. And we're sitting there going, how in the heck are we going to, to make that happen and be successful? And um, it's, it's, it's happened. It's, it's been 19 of them, or 18 of them now. So kudos to the mayor on that one. I didn't do anything. It was your idea. I would never came up with it, or someone's idea. Um, just briefly on this one, um, without dra <laughs> dragging us back in front of you. Um, the cool thing that I want to recognize here is, is, is Stephanie Galbraith and the initiative that she's taken to educate our citizens, and it's just been remarkable. This is the logo that they came up with. You'll see a website on there. Um, if you click on that or bring that up, it will have a copy of the full ordinance. It'll have frequency. Frequently Asked Questions. It will have a copy of the PSA I think you've already seen. And then it has a forms, forms spree question, open question, where if you want to leave um, a question for us that's not included, um, you can do that as well. I did ask the question if we have received any yet, and I was told just one. And they asked if uh, the ordinance included um, stop lights and we said yes and they said great S sorry Genesis but they were supportive of it so <laughs> you probably didn't want that on tape anyway <laughs> levels of service uh, about three years ago uh, we brought in front of you the PAM allocation model patrol staffing model um, presented to you and uh, you approved and that's been the guideline we've used over the last uh, three I believe um, budget workshops and when you look at what's in front of you now it's actual numbers versus goals and what we have in light blue is um, officer um, proactive time and that would be unobligated time. We're shooting what we're shooting for. The blue would be the dark blue would be um, public initiated calls, nine one one calls, calls for service. 
And uh, the 15% or 9% that you're seeing there is um, administrative. This is mostly court. And so we're actually doing good there where we estimated we'd be in court 15% of the time or only in there 9% of the time. But you'll see that uh, our public initiated calls for services much, much higher than um, what we projected. It's getting better. This is the only slide I have in here on the PAM allocation model. And the reason why is I can bore you to death and your eyes would glaze over and you would have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I would probably have no idea what I'm talking about. I can just tell you that there's a mathematical formula. It takes about 20 inputs, which you'll see is, is on workload requirements, the personnel policies, performance objectives, and roadway characteristics. Examples of those. How long does it take to write a report? How long does it take to write a crash? Um, desired levels of service, proactive versus reactive, which is what you saw in that last slide. Types of roads, miles of roads, mile or uh, speed limits of roadways. And then the personnel policies are actual time officers are available. You know, how, how much uh, obligated vacation time are they allowed under city policy? Because that's, they're not here to work. How many hours are they at training which are not um, available for calls for service? That's plugged in there. And then it outputs the number of patrol officers and traffic officers that's expected to run the city based upon those, those inputs. I will tell you, um, three of you probably don't care anymore. <laughs> so three of you that are, are staying with us and then the three council that are coming on board if you really want to look at what happens behind the scenes, the best thing I could have you do is come to our office, sit down with our crime analysis group, and we'll explain it to you and walk you through it and show you how it works. Um, um, it's, it's not really magic. It's uh, an Excel spreadsheet based upon a mathematical equation that's been adopted for 22 years. So um, that's all you're going to get on the PAM model this year. Take me two years to figure out to keep it brief, but I guess third time's a charm, right? Once you <coughs> plug in all the inputs, this is the output that we currently get. It's 90.5. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you go back and look at what it was indicating what we needed last year, we adopted all but three. And then this year, it's, it's um, I'm indicating an additional two. So right now, we are um, five down, what it says for um, allocated staffing for patrol. I will tell you, though, that uh, this is just the numbers that are appropriated. These aren't the numbers that are necessarily fielded right now. We currently have eight officers in the academy. We're currently working on filling eight additional slots for the April Academy. We'll be offering our making job offers for them in, in January. And five additional openings of patrol officers, a couple officers on light duty, one officer on um, over a year military leave. So when you start doing all that, we're about 30 officers down currently. Kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but those are the those are the numbers. I guess we'll see if I had it right or not. Um, we have 13 openings, so the eight and the five that we're working on. Um, three openings are on the non-sworn professional side. Um, current background: eight people, eight officers in the current Meridian Nampa Joint Police Academy. That's Academy number two, and then the. Um, Academy number three is slotted for April 2020. 
this is the time where we just want to recognize some of our great people. Um, because of our growth, we have created a um, training division. If you recall back in the budget workshops, you approved a training sergeant position, um, and that went to uh, <coughs> excuse me. That went to uh, Sergeant Tara Smith, and so there's a picture of her. Um, the training corporal is Justin Northway, and then a patrol sergeant was. Um, Kyle Ludwig. Just moved it out of my way. We've had some uh, promotions and assignment changes. We just wanted to give you a picture and some names of a couple people that uh, moved up into detectives, Steve Hansen, Matthew Farinato. Um Just for the record, Matthew's um, nephew is um, one of our CSOs, community service officers who is slotted for the Academy, the Patrol Academy in April, um, which is kind of what we had in mind when we put community service officers in place is we could build them up to be a police officer. He's going to go to the Academy in April, first one. It's a lot of pressure on MP in the first one. Uh, Laura Curley is our senior crime analyst. Um, she was promoted within the agency. And then, of course, we had to have Stephanie on here. It ends with Stephanie. Um, she is our public information officer. If you recall, this is, an off this is a position that um, took nearly a year to fill. I don't know why it took us nearly a year to fill when you had the, the best candidate within your own ranks. Great that, question. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I've, that, qu that question's been thrown back at me a couple times, so. I can acknowledge that it takes a while for us to get it. Since then, um, Stephanie has been very active in both the police and the fire side. Um, crazy busy, but uh, one of the things that um, we're getting ready to launch here in um, January is uh, a public, public outreach forum and it is um, through Nixle. But here is just some of the current things that we currently have going on as far as um, contact, social media contact with our, our citizens. And then this is the Nixle. Um, you'll be able to opt into this to get anything put out by the police department, public press releases, uh, missing persons, um, emergency information, um, whatever we want to uh, send out. If people are interested in it, you can get some options at the top there. If people are interested in it, they can opt in so they're not getting annoyed by us um, sending them things. It's their choice. And if it gets to be too much, they can opt out just as easily. More for that will be coming um, in January. And then I didn't put their pictures in here, but just to uh, give some advance notice, in the next three weeks, we're doing command staff rotations. This is a scary, <coughs> scary time for me because um, I've adapted to the people and their positions and their strengths. And um, it's hard when you, when you reassign because you have that learning curve. But um, I think it, ultimately it's what's best for the department. It's certainly what's best for the staff because it gives them a chance to grow um, and work on some of their succession planning. But uh, that just gives you an idea of where everybody's going to be. And if you see down at the bottom, you'll have special projects, Lieutenant. Um, this is a temporary assignment. And this is going to be an assignment while we go through our capital projects, and then he'll be assigned to patrol afterwards. But kind of segues into my next slide here. We currently have four capital projects going on in the police department. We have the scenario, of, I guess I probably should go in order. It's on the slide, make more sense. Um, the department remodel, the parking lot expansion of the main building, the public safety training center of Snarrow Village, in the new um, substation, Northwest Precinct. Just to give you an idea of where we're at on those, um, parking lot expansion, the 
concessional design has been completed and the work will start in the spring. The Public Safety Academy, I think there's an RFP being prepared for the construction manager. They've worked in um, designing it, but they haven't solidified the plans yet because they want to get a construction manager on board to have true costs and more realistic costs as they're, as they're final designing it. The new substation, we are supposed to have contract legal work in our hands this week. Then I'll turn over to Bill's office and purchasing so they can start reviewing that. Um, their timeline out there is a February break ground and a late summer, early fall uh, move in. And then the remodel is, is um, attached to the Snero Village and we're gonna use the same construction crews and so we'll actually start the Snero Village and then move into the police department afterwards. The capital replacement um, on the body worn cameras, if you recall, uh, you approved a, a third generation body worn camera. Uh, not only will it give um, better sound and better resolution. It has gunfire detection, which means that if it hears gunfire, it'll automatically turn the camera on 30 seconds pat from the buffer. So any officer that um, shoots their firearm, would that be captured on video, whether they want to turn it on or not. Um, it has camera location. So if you, it's kind of like, oh, where's my iPhone? So if you lose it, you can actually track it and we can go retrieve it. And if we can't retrieve it, we can retrieve the data off of it, even if we can't locate the camera. So those are some of the, the significant things on it. Um, oh, it has GPS tracking too, so we know where the officers are at. So it's an officer safety function as well. Those are being deployed um, mid-January. And I just wanted to talk briefly on the this focus area on the safe, healthy, and secure. We have um, eight tactics that's listed under this, but I just wanted to give some highlights on um, three of them because we've done some significant work. So under the traffic safety strategies, we've covered Focusing on educating our community on traffic laws. This includes Alive at 25, the Mayor's Senior Advisory Group on uh, safe driving, defensive driving, specialized uh, mobilization initiatives such as aggressive driving, seatbelts, um, DUIs. Uh, school zone violations, special traffic enforcement, crosswalks and in our hands-free ordinance educational stops. Um, under crime prevention, under the apartment community crime prevention program, it's 60% complete. We've sent um, Sarah Herrick to um, SEPTED for multi-housing units, and she's rolling out um, a three-phase approach for crime prevention within our apartment communities. And then on our communication plan, it is currently 50% complete. Um, it's kind of probably one of the things that uh, we noticed about Stephanie is when we started asking her in the interview about a communication plan, she threw it on the table and said, here you go. So um, it will be included in the uh, packets for uh, new council on the 20th and then we'll make sure that it's in the hands of, of all of you when it's ready to go. I think we'll end it there. Um, there's just so many things that we've covered over the year that uh, when I was sitting down with Stephanie, we just kind of had to grab some snapshots of some of the things. Um, otherwise, I'd be here all night. And you don't want to listen to me all night. So 
I thank you for the time, and I welcome any comments or questions you may have of me or anything that you would like for me to take back to our members. Thank you, Chief. Council, any questions? Ms. Law Roberts. Madam Mayor, um, no questions, but thank you, Chief. Thank you for your report. Thank you for all that you and your team do for this community. It has truly been, and I'm not a person that cries, so this is interesting. It's truly been an honor to work with you and your team. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Mr. Kavner. Jeff, thanks for the, the report. First, the part I think to, to take back kind of echoes Councilmember Member Roberts' comments, and that's that's thank you. In a, in a day and age where law enforcement is so unfairly criticized and every question, every decision questioned, I think the Meridian Police Department continues to rise above and really serve our community. And that it kind of gets to maybe a, a suggestion that speaks to, to 4A4, which talks about the perception of public safety in our community. And, and just a thought for KPIs is to also maybe include in that report um, the amount of complaints that we receive, because as I understand, it's fairly low. And I think it's something that is really worth celebrating. And the fact that it's already really low, but I know that that's not low enough for the department um, would be a great way to communicate to our citizens that we take the feedback seriously and we're always working to improve despite being really, really exemplary. Madam Mayor, Councilman Cavanaugh, that's, that's a good suggestion, um, and you are absolutely correct. I think over the years you've heard me report that when we added body worn cameras, our complaints dropped to 67%. I can tell you that we've not been um, su successfully or not even been sued for excessive force, for wrongful arrests, um, something that we're, we're quite proud of. When you do get um, the complaints, um, once you offer to let them see the video, they disappear, you know, and, and we're human. So occasionally we do have some complaints. We do have some professionalism, rudeness type complaints where the officers could have done a much better job and we admit it, we take it as a training uh, opportunity and we move on. Um, we track every single complaint that comes in our department. Um, we just don't put that out uh, forward facing. So it would be a, a discussion, um, but I don't see that as long as it didn't have any personal information, and I don't see that it's it's uh, protected by any means. So we'll take that under. I was looking over my shoulder because Stephanie has always got a notebook and she's always writing everything down. Anytime I say anything, she's writing it down. But I noticed that she was put, typing it in her, in her phone because she doesn't have her notebook with her, right? You were writing on the phone, though. There you go. That's why when you were talking, I was looking over my shoulder to see if she was captured, and she was. So thank you. We'll take that under advisement. Okay, any, anything else? Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, yeah, I will echo what uh, Council Member Lil Roberts and Milam said. We appreciate the work of your department, and um, it, it's mind-boggling when you start looking at the data and you look at the number of openings you still have. You have some great staff, and they're doing a phenomenal job, and just let them know how much we appreciate that. We'll do that. Thank you, Mayor. Madam Mayor. It's Milam. Excellent job. Uh, those numbers are amazing. I need to ask you a favor since I, I won't be a, have a chance to go over there. Can you give everybody a hug for me, the department? Oh, yeah, I want to be there. <laughs> Every single person. Yeah. Actually, actually <laughs> that could be doable because in February, you might have to wait till February. In February, um, we have something special for all the, the members, all the command staff. So I may not be able to hug every single one of them, but I can get one ninth of them. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Item 6A is under our Public Works Department, and I'll turn this over to Warren. Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, this next, <coughs> excuse me, this next item is a request by Morgan Holmes, who's uh, developing essentially 10 acres on, uh, out on 5060 South Locust Grove. 
It's just south of Amity and Locust Grove, the intersection there. Um, they are in the process of going through the city to uh, basically develop a subdivision on that 10 acre area of ground. I have asked that you all get some additional information there, which really the, the, the two pieces of information that I gave you was the ordinance language that we changed after the Butte fence. Uh, when they came in and did this, we, we decided to make some changes to make the process a little bit more thorough and straightforward. And I gave you that information so you know that we have followed that process. And in this case, they are actually, because those two, pro those two five acre parcels are now vacant, they've gone ahead through the county and started construction on one of the homes. And they're going to include that in the overall subdivision when they go through that process. But in the meantime, they would like to connect up to the water, that, the water line that runs right in front of the property and not drill a well and then have to abandon that well in a few months when they are able to incorporate that into their subdivision and come into the city. So this is really a request for them to connect this one home that they are in the process of constructing to our water system prior to taking the entire development through the entitlement process and essentially bringing it into the city as part of the, the overall subdivision. And we met, not only has Public Works looked at this, but I met with all the other departments, talked to them to see if there was any issues or concerns or conditions that they would want to place um, on this particular, uh, in this scenario. And essentially everybody was pretty supportive. I think everybody was in fact supportive of letting this one move forward. It seemed pretty, pretty straightforward. They're gonna come in, they're gonna do the right thing. And basically allowing this connection seems like the right thing to do. As long as certain conditions are met, you see in the letter, the memorandum that we put together, a lot of those conditions are, are iterated there. <clears throat> if you approve or give us direction tonight to go ahead, we will then prepare the agreement, which will ultimately have to come back um, for the approval of this council. And uh, that's where we'll, we'll finalize all those conditions and make sure that everything is in there. But uh, we're really here just seeking direction from you. Do you want us to go ahead, move forward at this point, and put an agreement together? Yeah. And with that, I'll answer, stand for questions. Okay, council. Madam Mayor. Mr. Palmer. Do you want head nods or a motion? <laughs> Um, or commentary from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Bill, that's, I don't know if we need a motion or if we just need direction to go ahead and prepare the agreement that we'll have to come back later for approval. Yeah. Madam Member. members of the council, um, direction's fine because we are gonna have to prepare an agreement to bring that back for approval. So if there's no objection from the council, we can no certainly move forward. Nope. Okay, council, all thumbs up. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Warren. Okay, we're at the end of our work session agenda. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Madam Mayor. Ms. Milan. Adjourn. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All ayes.